places we're going to talk, go into again and finish up our story, a steadfast joy, and we'll finish with the joy of giving, the joy given in Philippians 14 to 23. And as we look at this passage, we'll see a part of it is giving for the furtherance of the gospel, giving for the sake of, for people to be saved. But at the same time, as, I, as we think about it, this is the last passage of Philippians. And I don't know about you, but I'm going to miss the book of Philippians. When you go through Philippians, you slowly take your time through it. You truly feel like you've gotten to know Paul. You feel like you've really got a chance to meet the Philippians. And to leave the book of Philippians and to finish this and move on to something else, it's almost like saying goodbye to a, a f- close friend now. And as Shakespeare said, parting is such sweet sorrow. But as such, we will finish our passage in this joy of gain, Philippians 14, 23. And as we go through this, we need to remember the context of what Paul last talked about. And remember, the last thing he talked about in the previous uh, section was contentment, that the, the Philippians had sent this gift to him, and he had received it, and he was ex- joyous for it, but he wasn't joyous because he needed the money. He was joyous, as we'll see, because of what it would do for them, what credit it would be from. It, he said, I don't need the money. I'm content with that. But because he was worried that maybe they might get the wrong thing by I talk about content, he says, I want you to tell you what the true blessing is in it. Not that I have received money, Paul says, but it will be a credit to you. And so we want to look at three things. We're going to look at a faithful giving, offering to God, and a final benediction. Faithful giving, offering to God, and a final benediction. Now, let's look here at the first part. Faithful giving and supporting the fellowship of this Philippian church. And so as you open up to verse 14, it says, Now lest you have done well to fellowship me in my afflictions. Now, you need to remember the context of what's going on here. He had, uh, when he had left Philippi, he was, the, the, basically the townspeople had kicked them out. Paul got there. He preached the gospel. The, the Jews of the town didn't like it. Uh, no, no, sorry. The, the Gentiles, the Romans of the town didn't like it, and they kicked them out. He said, get out of here. We don't want you here. Leave. And then he goes from there, and he goes to different towns. And so he goes to his trials and tribulation. The, the other churches that he would normally go for support, they weren't there for him. But this church, this Philippian church, was a steadfast source of help and encouragement. When he was being afflicted, they were there walking with him. And this is something to encourage for us to remember, that when we go through trials and tribulation, we should be like this Philippian church. We do not leave a brother and sister in Christ who's going through trials and tribulation or hard times. We, we stop and say, how can I help you? How can I be a blessing? What are your needs? And when our, when our brother and sisters of Christ are going through trials and tribulation, how can we pray for them as Gary often is doing? Oh, but also when we have friends, and, uh, friends in the church that are struggling with sins, when, when our brothers and sisters are struggling with sins, we don't abandon them, we don't, we don't shun them, but we say, how can we come alongside of you and help you pray through this? How can we can encourage you in your faith? We need to be like these Philippians, be of, of encouraging each other. And actually, that's something that Paul has been doing for the Philippians himself. As they're struggling, being in this town the, of Romans are persecuting them, he's encouraged them, he's encouraged them to rejoice. And that is a type of fellowship that we should have in the church, that the church should be a place that we get love and comfort and joy. We just love to be here because we're with our church family. Uh, as I've often said, when we came back from COVID and you can meet in church again, there's no better place being that one to be. We want to be in church because that's where our church family is. We want to be with our church family because it's, th- we love them. We care about them. We rejoice in them. And that's what church family should be like 
And that's what these Philippians were like. Now, in verse 15, he then goes on and says, And you yourself know, Philippians, that at first preach on the gospel, after I left Macedonia, no church fellowship with me in the matters of giving and receiving, but you alone. For even in Thessalonica, you sent a gift more than once for my needs. If you were to remember Acts 16, and again, I want to remind you. So Acts 16, he went there, he preached the gospel, the citizens of Rome kicked them out. But he, as soon as he left Philippi, he then goes to Thessalonica. And once he gets there, he preaches the gospel in the synagogues again. And the Jews are jealous, and they rise up, and they create a mob to kick him out of town. And so he then moves to Thessalonica, and then goes to Berea, and he preaches in Berea. And while he's in Berea, those same Jews from Thessalonica come to Berea, create another mob to kick him out again. And, through, and then he would later on then go to leave Macedonia. After those two events, he leaves Macedonia and goes to Athens and Greece, uh, in Corinth. And throughout this whole second missionary journey is this Philippian church that is with them. And it's, uh, if we were to look at the times of, of the Philippian minister to his needs, if you were to look at uh, 1 Thessalonians 2.9, 2 Thessalonians 3.8, you, you'll hear these letters that Paul says, I, 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 I minister to you, but I did it without fee. I did it without charge because I didn't want to be burned to. And the same thing with Corinth and Acts 18.5 and 2 Corinthians 11.8, because he had the support from Philippi, because he, he worked with his own hands, he didn't need anything from Thessalonica, he didn't need anything from Corinth because he just wanted to be in Thessalonica. He just wanted to be in Corinth to minister to their needs, and he didn't want them giving him money or providing for needs to be a hindrance for the gospel. Instead, he, he, he wanted to serve them and during this time, the Philippians, in uh, 2 Corinthians 8, 1 through 2, he tells that the Philippians gave abundantly, but it's interesting, he gave out of their poverty. You know, so even though the Philippians are having trouble, things are not good in Philippi, they still want to help their brother in Christ, Paul. They had had, he had had such a great impact in their life that they want to give. And, and that's a kind of giving that we should have, that when, um, when our lives are transformed by the gospel, we should want to, want to do whatever we can to spread the gospel, where it's our time, money, or effort. We spend our time to spread the gospel. And even if we don't have much, in the Philippines, they say, gave out of their poverty, they want to spread the gospel because they believe in evangelism and ministry. Now he gets his part from their effort by those he's trying to reach the gospel to create, he doesn't want to create somewhat. This is the same reason it's important for us to support missionaries. And as, as, as we're talking, as we're uh, thinking about today, I mean, that is why, so this month is the De Martes, that's why we, we, we send them missions. They, they, they need our support. They need our prayers. And, and, and if we are not faithful givers, then they don't get the money they need to support. And so we give to our missionaries so they can do their work. And that's why the, the Philippians gave to Paul, because they want him to do the work of the gospel. This is not only true for missions work, and that's what Paul really was. Paul was really a missionary. A lot of times we think of him as a pastor, he was really a missionary. He was really an evangelist. And so he's more like the Demartes than a, a pastor in a church. Though he did pastoral ministry, he was a missionary. But the same thought goes for church ministry. If we want to see this church flourish, we need to sacrifice generously, both financially, which are time, money, and effort. Uh, the, the sacrifice like the Arthur and the Tuckers get for the youth ministry, the worship team, what they do, the outreach teams, that what they do, and, and even the food pantry, those are sacrifices. And the only way we want to see the gospel spread is we need to be generous with our resources because people need to see the gospel. They need to hear the gospel. And we cannot happen 
if we're just going to be like, well, my needs are more important. And as you see with the Philippians, that wasn't their view. They're like, I want to give generously to the ministry. And I'm not saying this because I want money. I know a lot of people hear this, oh, the church wants more money. No, uh, it is not, the point of it is not that I want more money or that the church needs more money, but we want to see the gospel work. And not only that, but it is for your benefit. It's not for my benefit that I care about. This is for your benefit. It's the reason why Dawn Hunt gave the $10,000 is because she cared about the future. She wanted to say, how can I make an impact in this city so people can come and feel welcome when they come to church? And that's why we're going to update some spaces because there's some spaces to make it more welcoming, especially for young families as they come here. That is why she did that. That is the impact she wanted to have. Paul uses an interesting phrase here. Now, I'm going to go back one. In a matter of giving and receiving, which is back one here. I'll go back here. The giving and receiving. This phrase is an interesting word. It's basically uh, something that's like accounting, but it's kind of like give and take. And, and, and to some degree, that's what friendships are. I do something for you, you do something to me. I help you, you help me. I love you, you love me back. That the way fellowship and relationship in the church should be is give and take. It should not be just the givers and the takers. No, there should be both giving and taking from both sides. If you have just a bunch of givers, then they're not receiving the blessings they can have from someone who can give to them. And if you have just a whole bunch of receivers, then they're not getting an opportunity to have the blessing to be a blessing to others. You need to have both givers and receivers. You need to be both. It's one of the things that, uh, as a pastor, we, I was talking to David Ray Sr., and I said, you know, I do need to get nourished every once in a while. And he says, well, where do you go to get nourishment? Where do you go to receive a blessing from people? Well, to some degree, it is church on Sunday, but it's also a pastor's fellowship. In fact, I go to two pastor's fellowships. So I can be ministered. So people can pray over me. And I need to receive as much as I give. In fact, there's a, a great principle of this is you can only give as much as you receive. You only can give as much as you receive. And you go on, because if you are not being filled up, if you're not hearing God's word, if you're not praying, if, you, if, someone's, not, if someone's not pouring into your life, you will not have anything to give back. And so you have to be active in being receiving, but th- you don't receive just to get filled up. Because what happens if you fill up, eventually the whole water spills over, it does no good. The reason why you receive, the reason why you go to church is to bring it out and to share it with others. is not to keep to ourselves, but is a giving and receiving. And we are to do that inside the church and outside the church. And this is kind of a principle that you see Paul is talking to these Philippians about. Now, however, Paul has a problem. The Philippians have given him a great gift. And they've sent them, provide for his need. You know, it's, it's abundantly overflowing. He has all of this. But he cannot give back now because he's stuck in Rome. He's stuck in Rome and under house arrest. Right? And so how can he give back? They have given so much to him. What can he give back? Now, to some degree, it's, it's the letter of Philippians. That is truly a great gift. It's a gift that keeps on giving as we are receiving it. But Paul tells them, as we'll see, that the gift that they will receive is something greater than Paul could give them, which is through God. So let's, let's look at the next part. The next part is the offering to God. And this is the principle that he wants you to understand that when we give to ministry, when we give to the kingdom of God, is really an offering to God. It says this, not that I seek the gift itself, not that he wants the money itself, but I seek the fruit which increases to your account. In other words, he's not, though he's happy to see the money, though he's happy for it to benefit the ministry, his real hope and joy is for the fruit of the increase of their account. 
Now, what is this account that we, we're, we're talking about? Well, first is the fruit of the spiritual growth, to, more like, to be more like Christ. As Jesus said in Matthew 6, 20 through 21, but store up yourself treasure in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, where thieves do not break in or steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. I know what he cares about, one of the things he cares about is where is their heart? If all you do is keep your money, your resources, and time in your pocket, then that doesn't say good to your heart. It says your heart is not in the right spot. But what he is saying is, what matters is where are you using your time? If you're using your time, money, and treasures, and talents for the building of the kingdom, then that shows you where your true treasure. Your true treasure is found in the kingdom and wanting to see it grow and expand. That is where your treasure is. And where you spend your money, a great sign to see where your heart is, is where do you spend your money? Do you spend your money generously to help the kingdom, or do you use your money to, for your own personal desires? Not that it isn't bad to want to buy some cl nice clothes, as you can see. Not that, you, not that it's bad to have a car and stuff. But where is your money? And you generously should be given to the kingdom of God because when you do, it shows something about your heart. And again, it's not about I want the money. It isn't that the church wants your money. It's about your spiritual interests. God cares about your heart. Now, when we invest in the ministry of the church, our God's kingdom, we are investing in our own spiritual treasure, not necessarily in physical blessings. This, this is one of the things some people think, well, it's always about physical. But sometimes, as I said, it's about spiritual treasure. Just think about it. it there are people lives that are being transformed because you gave. Do you know when you give your tithes and your offerings and you give it, you're like, well, what's this going to? Well, some of it is to help the DeMontes and all our missionaries, or, or the Shepherd's God's Parent Home, or we give, and it helps the youth ministry and reaching the youth. And, and when we give, do you, have you ever thought about the impact that has? That lives are given transformed because of your generous giving, it not, doesn't have to be just money, but time and treasures and talents as well. But that is why we give. We give because we want to see lives transformed. One of the things that me and a lot of pastors said, as I, as I went looking for churches to where I would serve in, the number one question I would ask, does your church give to missions? Does your church give to mission? Because a church that does not give to missions, heart is all wrong. It's become hard. It has not received the gospel. Now, one of the things I was excited when I got here, I was talking to Pastor John and everything. I said, tell me about missions. And he gave me this long list of all the missionaries. And that's what you want to see. You want to see a church that is actively giving to the growth and expansion of the gospel. It says your heart is in the good place. And I tell you the truth is you, you can outgive God. There's always more you can give. And the amazing thing is God will reward you here on this side of heaven or the next. Um, let me say this. I'm, uh, verse 18. But I have received everything in full, and have an abundance, I have been filled, having received from Epaphroditus, which you have sent a fragrant aroma, accepting sacrifice pleasing to God. Again, we see his gratitude for this gift, this abundant gift. He's so excited and receiving from Epaphroditus. But then he tells us the reason why the giving is important. When we give to the ministry of the church, when we give to honor and praise and the worship of God. That is why you give. You don't give for your own personal interest. It's not to get anything from it. It's for the praise and honor of God. When you give, it is a form of worship. And that is why I love the fact that before we give, 
we always have Gary comes up and prays for the offering because that is a point. The point of it is for God to get the glory and praise. It's a form of worship. Have you thought about your offering is a form of worship? And that is why it's important to, to sit down and pray over how much you're going to give. Have you ever done that where you, you went home and say, honey, we need to sit down, let's pray about what you think God would like us to give this year. And that's one thing that everyone told me and that will sit down and say, what do you think? And every once in a while, it might go up or, and, and change because we want to see how God is going to use it. In fact, the way we know this is about offering and sacrifice and, pl- uh, and, and giving praise to God, it uses this phrase, a fragrant aroma, acceptable and sacrifice pleasing to God. These are, these are worship words. These are uh, temple worship sacrifice words. If you go to the Old Testament, a fragrant aroma, uh, and we could go to a lot of verses, uh, and if you want to know them, I could tell you them, uh, and acceptable sacrifice pleasing to God. These were when they were given their sacrifices, where it be a sin offering or a f- phrase offering or a thanks offering, it would always describe it as a fragrant aroma, accepting and pleasing to God. And that is our, one of our ways we give sacrificially to God is through our wallets. We also do, do it through our prayers. We do it through service, but we are to give sacrificially, and that pleases God. And then one of the ways you can please God is right here. And again, this is not about me or the church. It's about you and your relationship with God. And you, we should want to give a smile on God's face. God, how can I please you? Give to his kingdom. Give to his kingdom. Helping other people. This is why we should prayer, prayerfully determine what God wants us to do. And one of the things I want to explain is in 2 Corinthians 9-7. It's one of my favorite passages. Because in 2 Corinthians 9-7, it says, Each one must do just as he purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsions, for the God loves a cheerful giver. Now, in this one verse, we get a principle. You notice when Paul talks about this, he does not quote an Old Testament passage about tithing. And I'll tell you the truth. When we give, it's not really a tithe. It is offering. The tithe is the Old Testament term. We live in a New Testament time, and in New Testament, we give an offering. But there's a similar principle. And not only that, but in the Old Testament, there's actually three tithes. Do you know that? In the Old Testament, it was actually 23% of your income. Uh, that, that was quite a bit of money. And there was three tithes. One was 10, 10, and one was divided up into three years. It was 23%. But we live in a New Testament time. And though the ta- a tithe or 10% might be a good sp- starting spot, that isn't a requirement. You notice it says, do what you feel what God has purposed in your heart. So he doesn't say, give a tenth. No, he says, pray to God and see what God lays on your heart. He might say 2%. He may say 8%. He may say 20%. He may even say 30%. But whatever it is, whatever you feel like God is in you, that is what you should give. Because it's about your heart, and you should do it joyfully. Like, ah, I get to tithe, I get to give an offering this week. I get to share with God's kingdom. I get to use my money for God's kingdom. And you should do it joyfully. And if you can't do it joyfully, if you, when you do it, if it's like, oh, I don't, I really don't want to give this tithe. I really don't want, then don't give it. I write you not give anything. Then do it with a grudging heart. It should be done with an open, joyful heart. And if you can't do it, then don't give it. You, and just spend some time with prayer. But I would encourage you, I would encourage you to give something. But only give you, only get back to that. Second, always give to the local church first. At any time when you do giving, give to your local church first because it's a minister to your brothers and sisters in Christ here. 
You should care about, this is your church family. This is your local church family. And should you want to care for your local church family first. That is always first. If you are always giving to everyone else but your local church, that's a problem. Because it says you don't love your brothers and sisters of Christ. Start here. And if you want to give extra to another ministry, then do that. But always start with the local church. Third, just so you know, when you're offering plate comes around, I do not always remember. Some of you have noticed that I sit there, and you notice when the offering plate, I don't put anything down. It isn't that me and my wife don't tithe. It just, I'm so much caught in the worship. I'm so much focused on my message. The last thing I'm thinking about is, oh, by, by the way, did I put the check in my wallet? And so Annette is always in the back, and she writes the check, and she puts it in, because she'll remember that stuff. Um, and so it isn't that I, I don't do it, it's just that Annette's the one who puts it in. I'm just too much focused in the church service, especially because Mark does such a wonderful job. Uh, the last thing I'm thinking about. By the way, there's multiple ways to give. You know, there's some people who just send it directly into the bank. That's fine. There's online giving. And there's some people, I don't know if you guys ever thought about it, you could give just once a month. But the important thing is you send them out, determine w what works for you. Now, finally, I know some people are in tight spots. I know some people don't have a lot of money. And if you can't give a lot, that's okay. Maybe the widow with two mites, that's all she could afford. That's fine. There is no dollar requirement. There's no percentage requirement. You can, maybe you can only give really this little, little, little. Maybe you can only afford a quarter. If that's what you can give, and you're doing it for the praise of God, praise God for that quarter. If you can give a dollar, great. If you give 20, great. Whatever God lays on the heart, that is what you should give. And God will not look at you any difference because he just cares about your heart. This is all this is, is a heart matter and a worship matter. And so I do not want to lay any burden on you. This should not be a burdensome thing but a joy sin like the Philippians did. Now, verse 19 then, um, and originally I had that separate, but now I put this together. Verse 19 says, And my God will fulfill all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Now, this reminds me of another great verse in Matthew 6, 33. Many of you are familiar with that, where it says, Seek first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness, and all of these things will be added to you. You see, when you seek, when you seek to worship and give first to God's kingdom, first, then he will provide for your needs. And you notice he does not say wants. He doesn't say, I will provide for all your wants. I know some of us want to have a nice car or a nice house, nice clothing. Some of us want to be in Florida and, and not in Maine during the wintertime. I know that some of you may want that. But that's not a need. It says he will supply all your needs. And this is basically just food, clothing, shelter. And I don't know about you, but I've experienced this. That when I seek first God's kingdom, he takes care of my needs. And sometimes... Not the way I would want it, but God has provided for my needs. As simple as, uh, I tell some people this story as people say, I'm going through hard times. I can't afford stuff as I should. I say, G well, I tell you the truth. There was a time when me and Annette went to, had to go to a food pantry for food when we were college students. There was a time when me and Annette had to beg for gas. But God still used those ministries that God was providing us through a food pantry. God was providing us for, by some being generous to give us gas. God provides. It's not always the way we prefer. But God will provide. These are, let me make it clear. What is the difference between want and needs? Because people get this confused. A want are things that we prefer to have, and a need are the basic needs for survival. And so God is going to provide for your basic needs, not always the way we want it to be. Also, in 2 Corinthians 9, 6, it says this. 
But this I say, he who sows sparingly will reap sparingly, and he who sows will be blessed, will also reap with blessing. Also in Proverbs 3, 9 through 10, honor Yahweh from your wealth and from the first of all your produce, so your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be burst with new wine. Throughout the, ver- throughout the scriptures, you do seem, there seem to be a blessing oriented. When you first focus on God's kingdom, he can bless you. Now keep in mind, everything you have is a blessing from God. I, I don't know if you've ever thought about it. Your clothes, your cars, your house, the gas in your car, those are all blessings from God. And it's often we forget to say, God, thank you for this. Thank you for this. And often we forget the, that blessing. Now, the other thing that we often forget is though, though some of the blessings we may not fit, uh, experience this side of heaven. Because there's some people who, who do die in need and want. It's unfortunately, we don't always understand why is it that God seems to provide for these people and not these people. But I guarantee you, in heaven, they will experience the full blessings of the kingdom of heaven that they so richly deserve if they put their faith in Jesus Christ. And this is the important thing. The most important blessing God could give you is redemption. The most important thing was he gave his one and only son, Jesus Christ, so you can be saved from sin, so you can be reconciled to God, so you can be made right with God, and so you can have a restored relationship with God, and that through it, you will receive the Holy Spirit who empower you and sanctify you and transform you. And that is the greatest blessing God has given us. And we often forget about that great blessing because we're so focused on the material possessions. And so this is a point of giving. It reminds us about our right relationship with God. It reminds us the important things. And not in the things of this world, but the things of the next. The things of the kingdom of heaven. The things of spreading the gospel. Giving offerings to God puts us in a right mind frame. Now we'll finish up with this quick benediction as we finish up the book of Philippians. And I love this benediction. Paul's benediction is always good. It's not like James. James just kind of ends his letters. Paul really wants to love on people when he ends a letter. And so he first starts off with, Now to our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. You know, you could just read that. Ah, And it reminds us, the Benedict reminds us again that the wonderful letter of Paul reminds us the most important thing is the glory of God. That's the most important thing. Of using our time and treasure for the glory of God, that is what's important. And we often fixate so much of the things of this world and the worrying about what's going on, what's going on in Ukraine, what's going on what politics, and we forget all about God's glory. And it's not just the reason why we mean that when we sit down to pray during our morning devotions, I always start with adoration. I always start with praising God because that's what's important. My life is to give glory to God and enjoy him forever. That is a point in life. And when we die and go to be with the Lord, that is still your purpose, is to give glory to God and enjoy him forever. That is a thing that we will continually do throughout our lives. Now, as he goes on, he then talks about two other principles, and 20, uh, 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 21 to 22, that was a little off. Uh, greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brothers who are with me greet you. And all the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. In these two sentences, Paul once again points to the importance of unity in Christ. All the saints here all greet every saint in Christ so that the Philippians, whenever a saint come, greet them. And by the way, all the saints with me greet you. And this is the type of of unity we should have as brothers and sisters in Christ. The sense of unity that we greet one another, that we don't see division, we don't separate from 
them or that, or those are my Calvinists, and those are my Arminians, and those are the pre-mid, and those are my post-mid. But we, we don't divide over certain issues. There's some issues you do divide over, but there should be a sense that if we're believers in Christ, that we trust Jesus also, that we greet one another. We, we should be a place of warm welcome. And he reminds us again of this unity we should have in Christ. Not only that, and by the way, that's why I love the men's fellowship. When we get together, we have all these men from all these different churches giving praises God. That unity there, that is what he's kind of given an image there. But it's really neat here, though, because he says, and all the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's house. Oh, my. Caesar's house. I mean, this is the Caesar that at some point in time will then turn against the church and persecute them, that, that there are people, now when he talks about Caesar's house, he's not talking about Caesar's wife or children, but what he's talking about is those under Caesar's control. So that'd be like some of his military leaders, some of his servants, maybe some of the free men. He's talking about those people that are in part of Caesar's government who have become Christians. Now let's think about that. Pagan Rome, and at this point, a very debauched pagan Rome, the Christian, the gospel message can penetrate even there. And when we are so disheartened about what's going in Congress or around the world, and we think, there's no way it's going to change. Guess what? If the gospel could change Rome into a Christian nation, it certainly can bring the United States back to a Christian nation once again, because that's the power of the gospel that transforms lives by the power of the Holy Spirit through what Jesus did on the cross, through the will of the Father. God can change people's lives. And we see it here at this amazing point that Caesar's household are greeting them. Amazing story there. Paul says something truly, uh, the, uh, and then we'll finish up with the last verse. He then says, the grace of the Lord, Jesus Christ, be with you, be with your spirit, is by God's, no, no, nothing else, by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is what's important. That is the thing that we receive. Though we give glory to God, what we receive from God is grace. Grace is what we needed. Grace is what he did when he died on the cross. He gave us grace. Grace is what he imparted when he gave us his righteousness. It's by God's grace that we come to believe in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. It's by God's grace that we're being transformed in the image of God. It's by God's grace that he sustains us. It's by, because God has given us so much that we freely give everything we have for the glory of God, because through his grace, he enables us to be rich with what we have and to give it freely back to him, because everything we have comes from him. We freely give it back to him because of his grace in our lives. And it's why, I, I, if I could sum it up, the joy of giving is freely given to the kingdom of God through his praise and glory. That is the joy of giving. We freely give. We welcome him. We joyously give for God's kingdom through his praise and honor. That is the only reason. Now, I want to give you a couple of things to consider. First thing. Consider how you can use your time, money, and resources for the building up of God's kingdom. How can you do that this week? How, what is the area in your life that maybe you're not giving your time, money, and resources? What is the area that God has given you or placed on your heart to where you can give? Um, I was reading this section, uh, 2 Corinthians 8 9, and it talks about how the church is the center of giving. We are to bless others. It should be from the heart. We should be blessed, the giver. It should be proportionate, glorify God, and handle honestly. But the, we should find ways to give to God. Second, consider how you can be a blessing to someone in need. 
you may know someone today who's in need that you can be a blessing. And think about how you can do that. Who is a person you know that could use your blessing, your grace, your mercy, that you can be a blessing to? Who is God put on your heart to be a blessing towards? Finally, consider how much God has given you and give him thanks. And, and, and in fact, let me do one thing. I, I heard this a couple times from different people I was listening to, but let me just say, which just, just a moment here to say, thank you, God. And I want to do this together. And so we'll just real quick, I'll just count one, two, three, and we'll say, thank you, God, together. One, two, three. Thank you, God. And we we'll always be thankful for what you give. Now, right before I got done, I, I ran across this story. And it was so adorable, I had to share it with you guys. It says this, a little girl told her friend that she was going to give her papa a pair of slippers for his birthday. Where will you get the money, asked her friend. She opened her eyes wide and said, why, father will give me the money. For a moment, the friend was silent as he thought that the father would buy his own present. And the father loved the little girl and appreciated the gift, even though he paid for it. We have nothing of our own to give to God. Everything we give, we give back to him. Everything belongs to him already. So let us freely give to God, and he will love the gift from his children. <laughs> If you like these videos, please like, share, subscribe, and ring that bell. God bless you, and have a good day.